From a purely economic standpoint, renewable electricity production here in the South is far cheaper than in Europe. In addition, it will help create jobs here. That will cut back the stream of people migrating to the North, where they aren't exactly welcomed with open arms. Thirdly, you get a 60% reduction in carbon dioxide per invested euro. But ultimately, the kilowatt hours have to get from the south to the north. My only wish is to live to see that day. There's always a strong breeze on Morocco's Atlantic coast, strong enough to keep the rotors of Essaouira's wind energy park in almost constant motion. It's the biggest in the country, with 71 wind turbines generating enough energy for about 50,000 households. Morocco's wind energy industry started small, but it's getting bigger fast. Khalid Benhamou is looking for investors for wind parks projected to be a hundred times the size of this one. They would generate as many new jobs as well. Benhamou is an engineer who looks beyond the technical requirements for wind energy. He also considers political aspects. This wind park. This wind park cost about 80 million euros and only created about four jobs locally. Obviously, that's a very low return on an investment that size. So we have to make sure we can build bigger wind parks. We only get the kind of surface area we need in the south, on the Tarfaya Strip, where we could develop the local industry. Sand and sun, wide open spaces, and wind is just about a perfect description of Morocco's southern regions. For over 20 years, Abdelaziz Banuna has been fighting to put the natural wonders of his country to work producing energy. Now, as the world wakes up to the fact that the future of energy is sun and wind, he may get somewhere. Enough of both kinds of renewable energy could be produced in the northern African desert to keep Europe humming. There are a lot of trade winds here, with mid-range wind speeds of about 8 meters a second at 10 meters above ground. Modern wind turbines are up to 100 meters tall, where the wind speeds here are more than 20 meters per second. In the area we're looking at right now, wind parks could produce electricity in the gigawatt range. The turbines could run for up to 5,000 hours a year, providing enough power for all of Morocco and some for export. This stony desert region is almost entirely devoid of human habitation. The only person to be found here is the radio tower watchman. He may be getting some company soon if Ben Hamou realizes his dream of an enormous wind park. Turbines would stretch from here to the horizon, generating green energy to light up Morocco's major cities and parts of Europe as well. But the ground has to be prepared first with precise data. I'm measuring the exact coordinates from this telecommunications tower so we can install wind speed gauges. They'll be part of a program to measure wind speeds in the entire region so we'll know just how much energy we can produce here. Thank you. 
Egypt's Red Sea coast is becoming a major Middle Eastern tourist magnet. Tourists tend to use a lot of electricity, and some of that energy is coming from northern Africa's biggest wind park. Zafarana packs more than 500 turbines onto about 20 square kilometer. Only on the occasional winter day will the wind die down. And Zafarana is still growing. The German GTZ Technical Aid Agency has invested 150 million euros in even more turbines. Some experts believe that the Red Sea winds could provide almost 10% of the Egyptian populace with electric power. Cairo plans to generate 12% of the energy for its power grid from wind by 2020. The government would rather export Egyptian natural gas for cash revenue, while the country's meager oil reserves may only last another 15 years. With 18 million people, Cairo is one of the world's most populous cities. And like many megacities in developing nations, Cairo and its energy needs are still growing. Within a generation, there will be hardly any alternatives to renewable energy. This is a historic site. Almost 100 years ago, the first solar mirrors were built here. An engineer, Amina El Zalabani, introduces us to a place that everyone should know about. We are here in Maadi, uh, where the first solar thermal power plant was uh, erected here. It was in 1914. It was erected by the German uh, colleague. And you know, it is for the water irrigation. And the River Nair is very close to this area behind this building. And this is was for irrigation of uh, plants. And here it was a very good plants uh, in this area. Now, irrigation isn't the only thing happening in this region. In Koraimat on the Nile, some 90 kilometers south of Cairo, Egypt's solar energy industry is growing. Construction workers are putting in the frames for more than 50,000 solar mirrors to be mounted in the coming months. A company from Cologne called Flagsol is building the precision steel mounts for the mirrors. El Zalabani has worked closely with project manager Klaus Ruhmann of Flagsol from the start. To reopen it, you can just use it once. Did fix it? The did fix it? That's correct. The power plant, soon to stand here, will only generate 4% of its energy from the solar collectors. Gas will have to provide the rest. The solar module was developed by Flagsol. Solar power plants with parabolic mirrors like these are being built all over the world. It's not yet clear if they will prove feasible for developing nations like Egypt. Because of course, uh, all of us are uh, thinking of clean energy, uh, especially from solar, but we are still waiting uh, to, for the price to be lower uh, because the, this technology is still expensive. This is our first chance to prove to Egypt that the technology works and it's efficient. It might give us a foothold so we can build purely solar power plants here in the near future. Solar power is an obvious source for generating electricity along the world's sun belt. The mirrors will cover an area equal to 18 soccer fields and reduce the carbon dioxide emissions of the natural gas power plant. The timetable foresees the first modern combination solar power plant in Africa going into operation in 2009. The biggest solar power laboratory in the world is in southern Spain. 
year, the sun over Europe is hot enough to test cutting edge solar thermal technology. Christoph Richter of the German Aerospace Center has been working here for over 15 years. He and his colleagues have helped develop concepts for desert solar power plants that produce green energy not only for northern Africa, but for Europe as well. This is a parabolic trough collector. The mirror concentrates the sunlight onto a black absorbent tube which runs through an evacuated glass tube. Heat transfer fluid in the tube will typically reach about 400 degrees Celsius. Then it goes through a steam generator and the steam turns the turbines that produce electricity. This is currently the most commercially viable solar technology. Several power plants are being built with it here in Spain and we could use it to build really big plants in the Sahara. We think we could reach price parity with conventional electricity in about 10 years. Just a hundred kilometers to the north, a Spanish-German joint venture has built the first commercial parabolic trough power plant in Europe called Andesol 1. Three more fields of mirrors will be added over the next few years. Andesol uses a new technology to keep producing energy even when the sun is not shining. The day's heat is stored for up to seven hours in two tanks of molten salt. The Moroccan Sahara is among the best places in the world for solar power plants. Its rocky terrain cuts the risk of sand blowing into the parabolic mirrors, and there's a natural salt sink 50 meters below sea level. Abdelaziz Banuna envisions filling the sink with seawater from the nearby Atlantic and using it to store solar energy. This is a gorgeous landscape with beautiful shades of color. And we could utilize it by building a pump storage power plant to regulate the fluctuating energy resources of wind and sun. The capacity is enormous because this sink is about 300 square kilometers wide and it could store up to a thousand gigawatt hours of electricity. Whenever excess power is generated, it would be used to pump up water. When more power is needed, it would then flow back down to turn the turbine. The Moroccan capital, Rabat, is a boom town. Dita U of the German Technical Aid Agency sees many opportunities for renewable energy here. We are here on the development of the development you might call this a research lab for the Bouregrec Valley. The river separates the city of Rabat from its twin Saleh. This is one of 80 major urban development projects in Morocco, initiated by the king himself to improve the construction situation and to create more residential space. One of the ideas in this concept is to make the region's power needs carbon neutral by creating wind parks to the left and right of the estuary. The more Morocco develops economically, the more the nation will need renewable energy. It has neither oil nor coal and very few gas reserves but the government still hesitates to invest seriously in wind and solar energy. Aziz Banuna and Dieter U believe that may change, perhaps when the European Union finally starts acting on plans to import solar-generated power. I hope the authorities in Morocco don't need another oil crisis or drought to motivate them to concentrate more on renewable energy sources. I share that hope. 
Because there's certainly cause for doubt that it will happen anytime soon. The EU's Mediterranean solar plan might help, though up to now it's just a political concept that still has to get more punch through both bilateral and regional talks. And it has to come about within a development partnership between Europe and the countries of Northern Africa. Hani Nokrashi has lived and worked as an engineer in Germany for years. When he comes home, he takes regular trips out to the Egyptian desert to get away from the rat race in Cairo. He is following the same dream as his Moroccan friend Aziz, solar power to bind Egypt and Europe together. By 2050, Egypt could be supplying part of its solar energy to Europe. It would take about a thousand square kilometers of space, or one one thousandth of Egypt's total land area. That would cover about half of Germany's electricity needs. Nukrashi heads off to Cairo University. He's meeting with two top Egyptian experts on renewable energy, Amin Mubarak and Adel Khalil. They're both professors on the mechanical engineering faculty. The three men have known each other for years. In that time, they've hashed out many concepts for the energy future of Egypt and how they can convince the government to do more for renewables. They'd like to see bigger solar thermal power plants built in the desert. That's where the country has enormous potential. We are going to open channels uh, also for PhD to send our uh, students to get... Yeah, you can see from this map how small the area uh, covered by solar thermal collectors can supply the demand for electricity for all the Middle East and North Africa and uh, this area uh, to supply the requirement for uh, Europe and this for the world. And uh, we, we should not have the local vision only, we should have a wide spectrum of having uh, the market in, in the, the region and maybe a fraction of the production will satisfy the needs of the European uh, community. A network of special high-tension electric cables could transport green energy from the desert to Europe. There's very little lost voltage in these conductors, about 3% per thousand kilometers. That means a cable from North Africa to the centers of European industry, about three or 4,000 kilometers long, would lose between 10 and 12%. Prices for electricity produced in solar thermal plants should be significantly lower by 2050. Professor Mubarak would uh, tell us something about the potential. The people who could make that energy future happen are sitting here. In 2009, 10 young engineers from Northern Africa and Germany will start work here on their master's degrees in renewable energy. It's an exchange program with Germany's University of Kassel. But you see that solar energy have the highest potential and um, it is planned by uh, the MENA region. Besides learning about the latest renewable energy technology, the future graduate students will also study each other's language and culture. The area that you need. And they will have a, a big part in forming the policies in the future because they will be open-minded and they will, uh, they, they will be convinced about the importance of renewable energy and I think uh, there should be more out of these engineers who have multiple skills and this uh, new generation will be the leading generation in the future. The desert has been a determining factor in Northern African cultures for millennia. And now it may hold the key to the region's future in both energy and water. 
This is one of the biggest desalination plants in the Western Sahara. It uses a technology called reverse osmosis, which works through high pressure and special filters and lots of power. That power could be generated by the powerful trade winds blowing through wind turbines. In addition, a solar thermal power plant could be combined with desalination using the heat differently from how it's used in reverse osmosis. Abdeslam Julid is responsible for the quality of drinking water in this region. This is a windy area. And of course, we could use the wind's energy. The same is true of solar energy, because the sun shines all year round here. Studies have shown that if you use not only the electricity generated by solar thermal power plants, but also the heat itself in desalinating seawater, it can be very profitable. It works the same way as the gas power plants that heat nearby homes in Germany. And luckily for Morocco, there's a lot of wind as well as sun here, and the sea is very close by. Desalination is a lucky byproduct of producing solar thermal electricity. The Moroccan Water Agency is aware of this but the government has not yet announced any plans to exploit it. Aziz Banuna, for one, likes the taste of solar desalination. We head out of Rabat on a special visit. A journalist built this house, one that is making an environmental impact in Morocco. And here, 840 uh, watt. Only sun and wind are used for cooling and heating. And this is here, this Hochspannungsleitung, yeah? Right next to it is the longest power line in Morocco. It leads to the cities of Casablanca and Rabat, and then on to Spain. It's an inspiring place. Benuna and Benhamou are dreaming of what they call green electrons. The GTZ did a study on Morocco's potential. The result was that its potential for wind energy is about 200 times what Morocco is using now. So there's plenty of opportunity here, and the solar potential is even greater. That's the advantage we have here in the desert. Hundreds of square kilometers of blank stone. To move forward quickly, you have to be able to see a long way ahead. That's why I say we have to have a vision. We don't have to do everything today, but we have to have a clear vision of where we want to go. He's a scientist, you're an engineer, I'm an engineer too. What we need to organize a partnership between Europe and this region is a strong European policy. A policy that won't encourage individual European energy companies to sit back and put their feet up, while all the renewable energy comes from down here in northern Africa. And people will see that this vision of a long-term job-creating energy industry will be a viable alternative for both North and South. It doesn't matter if it's sun or wind. What's crucial is that we start as soon as possible. Time is short. Akhenaten worshipped the power of the sun, and that symbolism is clear here. These thin rays end in giving, blessing hands. He was the first to see the sun as the source of all life.
And that's why he honored its power. As hostilities continue in Gaza, Israel's security cabinet is debating a unilateral...